Okay, Mark chapter number 5, and we're going to start reading in verse number 1. And it says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and, fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried with a loud voice said, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him so much that he would not send him away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. And they were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Our great heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for this day. Lord, we just thank you for being so good to us, Lord. We're thankful for everything you blessed us with. We're thankful to be able to be here tonight, Lord. Lord, we ask you to be with all those prayer requests. Uh, Lord, remember those family members and those uh, that just have cancer, those families that have lost loved ones. Lord, we ask you to be with those that are sick, those that can't be here tonight. Uh, Lord, those that are providentially hindered, Lord, you just help them. Lord, we ask you to be with those that may be watching. Lord, they know they can't be here, uh, but Lord, are just watching from home. You just bless them and help them. Lord, I ask you to be with me. Lord, to help what you've laid upon my heart. Help me not to say anything contrary to your word. and Help me not to say anything you don't want me to say. Lord, and just help each and every one of us get some help here tonight. And we all leave out of here closer to you than we came in tonight, Lord. And ask you to just help us and meet with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing I want to look at by way of introductions, we see in verse number 2 as well as verse number 6, we see the rushing that this man did. Um, in verse number 2, we talked about when Jesus was come over, immediately there met him a man out of the tombs. And it says it again in verse number 6, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Now I got to thinking about that. Uh, you, you see, and I, and I understand the lost need for Jesus Christ. I understand that if you're lost, I understand that there's need for Jesus to be saved. I completely get that. How come we don't have that same attitude, though, when we see the Lord? How come we don't come rushing into church uh, when, when, when it's time to come into church? How come we don't come rushing in to be able to meet with the Lord? Now, I understand, especially on a Wednesday night, you might have worked all day and you've worked hard, and it's just a struggle at times to get home and get ready, get cleaned up, maybe eat dinner, and all those kinds of things to get here. But what about on Sunday mornings when we get out of bed? What about on Sunday nights when we shouldn't be having, uh, uh, you know, a whole lot going on before Sunday evening service possibly? Why is it we can't come rushing in here looking forward to hearing from God? We'll come dragging in Sunday morning like we just stayed out too late Saturday night. We'll come dragging in Sunday night because we didn't get our Sunday afternoon nap. And we don't come in excited looking to hear from Jesus Christ the way we do. But we see the rushing in verses number 2 and 6. Receive the refusal to be tamed in verses 3 and 4. Who had his dwelling, talking about this man among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. How often do we have that refusal? Uh, we seem to have no problem to give in to sin. We'll have no problem be having ourselves allowed to be bound by sin. We get caught up in something that takes us away from God, and, and we'll just allow that to just keep us and keep us and harness us. But when it comes to the things of God, we refuse to give in and let God do something in our life. How often do we just pray and just say, God, uh, we know what Paul said in the road to Damascus, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Why do we have a refusal to God uh, to allow him to be able to work in our life? We too often treat God the same way I feel like this uh, uh, demon-possessed man here did in verse 3 and 4. We, God will, will get into a revival, will get into maybe even just a good Sunday morning uh, message, and when God starts doing something, start stirring our heart, and we immediately just kind of break out of it. We'll skip a service or two, or, or skip reading our Bible a day or two, because we just don't want to get too close to God. If I get too close, He might ask me to do something I'm uncomfortable in doing. 
I get too close, he might ask me to do something that I'm just not prepared to do, and we just kind of break away and try to get away uh, from the things of God, so to speak. We see the remaining in verse number 5. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. We see him remaining there in the mountains, in the tombs, constantly staying. Where do you remain? Where, where are you dead set on remaining? In the things of God or outside in the world? Pretty simple question. We'll just move on. We see the remedy, though, in verse number 8. We know that he, he, we've already talked about in verse number 6, when he's seen Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. But then we see the remedy that God, uh, that Jesus gives him. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. There are so many times that we run from place to place and man to man and woman to woman and, and self-help book to whatever it may be, and there may be a time and place for each of those things, but it would help us a lot if we would just get to Jesus. It'd help us a lot if we would just uh, realize where Jesus is at and we would just be like this man and just run and, and do everything we can to get to him in order to worship him. So we see the remedy there in verse number 8, and we see the relief that he gets in verse number 13. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. And they were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Now, can I say, and that's, this is what we'll get to in the message here in just a second. Can, can you imagine being there? Can you imagine being there, Brother Tyler? See, I'm afraid too many times we read the Bible, and, and I don't want to say we read it like stories, but I wonder how many times we read it and realize this happened. This took place, Brother Charlie. Imagine standing there and seeing those, those swine and just see them all of a sudden just take off and run over the cliff. Why did they do that? Because my God's just that big. And that's what I want to preach on with the Lord's help tonight. He's just too big. Number one, let me say, he's just too big not to be seen. Look with me down verse number 14. And it says, And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was done. Now understand that Jesus came across, uh, we talk about, we already seen it in verse number one, he came over the other side of the sea, this man was in the tombs and he, ran, he runs to meet him, so now you, you probably wonder if you're, uh, put yourself in the pictures of one of these other people that fed the swine. You're standing there watching, what's this goofball going to do? I mean, we, we know how he is, we know how he acts, uh, we know everything about him, his history. What's he going to go to Jesus for? And then all of a sudden we see the, the uh, swine now run into the sea, and these people seen what Jesus had done. So we see him, they go into the city to begin to tell people. He's just too big not to be seen. Why is it that we can go through our life day by day and fail to see what Jesus does? How is it that we can go to school, we can go to work, we can go uh, whatever it may be, and we fail to look and see what Jesus has done? I, we, we would be with, we should absolutely, every time we hear a song like Sister Caitlin saying, or we hear a song talking about Jesus and how great he is, that we shouldn't just kick the walls out. We seem to forget to realize exactly how big he truly is. We fail to see sometimes exactly how he's worked in our life. Yeah, I was preaching this past Sunday and over in the men's service at the jail, and, and right in the middle of it, God just kind of laid up my heart to share my testimony and looking at things. And you just, when you go back and just see how many things that God orchestrated to get me where I'm at today in my life, and by no means am I trying to, not for nothing, just of where I am in my life. How many times do we just fail to see Jesus do a work? But all these men right here, they was without excuse, they seen it. And it says that in verse 14, they that fed the swine and they ran and told it into the city. When Christ does a work in us, does it show out to those around us? Do we allow it to be seen? How many times do we have something go our way, Brother Donald, and we want to talk about, well, well because of that hard work I did down the job, they gave me race, and now I could afford a new car. How about... God allowed me to have the job that I have, and God gave me the smarts and the ability to do that job to even be able to get a promotion, to get that more money or whatever it may be. How often does God do a work in our life and we don't show it out the way we should? Not only is he just too big to be seen, he's too big to stay the same. What's it say in verse number 15? And they come to Jesus, talking about those people that they went and told him, and seen him that was possessed with the devil, what's it say? And had the legion sitting and clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17, we all know the verse, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to question your salvation or anything, but if he's that big in your life, you won't be the same that you was before you got saved. He should, we should all be different. There should be no doubt people look at us and say, you're different. I don't know how many times I've heard Brother Phil talk about, heard Brother Brian talk about uh, the friends that they used to have in their life can look at them and tell them, say, you're different than what you used to be. What about the rest of us? See, now I'm not trying to throw off on them. I, I'm not trying to pick on them. But those are just two examples here that talk about some of the things they did beforehand. You might have grown up in church. Good for you. That's wonderful that you didn't face some of the things that they did. There's still a difference. You should still be able to tell a difference. Can I say, I felt a difference. I went to church my almost entire life. I didn't miss a service for whatever it was, 20-some years. Uh, when me and Tina started going to church, it was probably 15, 16 years. I didn't miss a service, Brother Phil, that I wasn't working or wasn't gone on vacation or something. Lost. I could tell a difference in myself. I could feel a difference in my heart when it got saved. He is too big to stay the same. He came and he had this man that was possessed with the devil and he would just run around and be crazy and cut himself and now all of a sudden all the people come and find him sitting and clothed and in his right mind. He was different. He was different. And you know what? He was so different, what did it say? That he scared them and clothed in his right mind and they were afraid. They were scared of who he was. Do we scare anybody? I'm not saying that we got to act like Brother Phil. I'm not saying we got to be some crazy lunatic. I'm not telling you to be a Jesus freak, so to speak, or something, but do we scare anybody? Or do they know there's no chance Brother Josh is going to share the gospel with us? He might talk about going to church. He might talk about doing this, but we ain't got to be afraid of anything he's going to say. We ain't got to be afraid of him trying to shove Jesus down our throat. And I'm not saying that we need to do that, but every now and then we should at least try to share the gospel. Every now and then we should put the fear of God into somebody that they should be able to look at our life, if nothing else, and see they're a little bit different. I better find out what's going on in their life. He's too big to stay the same. Can I say this thirdly? He's too big not to spread. In verse number 18 and 19, he says, When he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him, said, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath compassion on thee. How often do we spread the gospel? How often do we share the gospel with anybody? Think back, just sitting here right now, he's way too big for us not to share not only the gospel, but even just what he's done in our life. But just, I want you to think back for a minute. Just, just, set, just think amongst yourselves, when was the last time I shared the gospel with anybody? That's what our desire should be. We should desire to see people get saved. Absolutely, we should tell them, and we'll get to that in a minute, what we should tell them what Jesus has done in our life. But who was the last person, and when was the last time you shared the gospel with anybody? When was the last time you sat down and told somebody, or you even just had a conversation with them at work, and you just said, you know what? The way you live your life, you're going to die and go to hell if you don't get saved. Let me tell you about Jesus and what he's done for me. Because I have found a lot of times, if you just kind of just kind of get that uh, into the conversation a little bit, talking about what God's done for you and what Jesus has done for you and the things that they've done in your life and how he's changed your life, that can open the door. You know, just talking about going to church. I don't know how many times at work I've just brought up, you know, hey, this, uh, my buddy at church or, or uh, the guy, this guy at church or something to that effect, and it just opens up a conversation. And how then they'll start asking questions. They all of a sudden want to start asking questions about things. Yeah. You know, or, or you, you talk to that and you might think that they're not listening at all. Then all of a sudden, a week later, you get and they come up and say, Hey, yeah. you go to church. Explain yeah. this to me. What's this, what's this talk about? Why do so many people think this is the end times? Why do, so, why do I hear so much talk about God coming back? And what's all this talk about this? And that gives you an opportunity yeah. to be able to share it. He's too big not to share. This, this man knew what Jesus had done in his life. He knew how Jesus had already changed him. He knew the relief uh, that he got when Jesus uh, cast out those unclean spirits, and he wanted to go with him. He wanted to be able to go with him, and just wherever Jesus was going, that's where he wanted to be. What about us? Wherever Jesus is going, is that where you want to be? 
Do you just want to follow him, God, wherever you want to take me? That's what I, I'm, I'm game for. Whatever it may be, I'm ready to go. But too many times, we like to just kind of, as we talked about in point number two, stay the same and just sit right where we are. We are perfectly content going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Hey, if preacher wants to have a revival, amen, we'll come and we'll shout the house down. Just don't ask me to do anything outside of here. Because we're just comfortable. We, we've hit our comfort zone, I'm afraid. And I don't know, you know, this, this is just me now thinking out loud. I don't know if it's just a comfort zone that we just think that, hey, whoever's going to get saved, God's going to save them, and that's just the way it's going to be, whether I take any part in it or not, Brother Phil. Or if we just think things are so bad, if people can't see the writing on the wall now, there's no hope for them. I have no idea what it is. But I know we're still here. God's still got something for us to do. I know God still, he's not returned yet, so there's still a lost and dying world out there that's not in here tonight that need Jesus Christ, that need us to be willing to go and spread the gospel, that need us to be able to go do something. Can I say it? This was a blessing. This absolutely blessed my heart. I got a piece of ice there. I'll get yelled at for that one. Don't be taking too many drinks. Tell Tina if she's watching, Bella told me I could get a drink and calm down. Monday night. We all know, me and Brother Randy even talked about it a little bit on Sunday. They was talking about the weather, and it was going to rain all day and all this stuff. And, and turned out, God bless us, and we just had a little shower there in the afternoon. Some places it might have rained a little bit harder. We was able to go out on visitation. So you have a night that I don't know how cold it was. I know it was chilly. It was cold. It was cloudy. It was nasty. And we had close to 30 people show up to go out on visitation. And that's not even counting some people that couldn't be here because of ball practice and stuff like that. If we had everybody here that we normally do, we might have had close to 40. I say that because it's not that hard sometimes to be willing to go spread the gospel. It's not, it's not rocket science, so to speak. Sometimes just tell him what he's done for you. Just tell, just tell him what he's done in your heart. Just doing that sometimes can open somebody's eyes. He is way too big not to be willing to spread the gospel and spread what he's done for us. And I say this fourthly, he's way too big just to stay setting. In verse number 20, and he departed, at this, after verse number 19, we'll read, Evan, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. What are you doing for him? I know we talk a little bit about there about spreading the gospel, and that should be our desire. But other than that, what are you doing for him? I understand completely who I'm talking to tonight. The Wednesday night crowd, the, the backbone of the church, so to speak. I understand completely, but still, just because we're here, don't mean we're doing all for him that we can be doing. Just because we are here doesn't mean we're exactly where we need to be. What are you, when it comes down to it, what are you truly doing for the cause of Christ? Now, I talked about all those people, and it is wonderful. It, I, I, I love, absolutely love our church, that you see all the things that go on around the church and know all the stuff that it makes to make our church run, from uh, cleaning the church, taking care of the grounds, to those that uh, go out on visitation, those that stuff the bags, those that teach Sunday school. It takes a whole lot to make Emmanuel Baptist Church run. And I'm so thankful. But even beyond that, maybe I didn't, didn't save your certain job. But what is it are we doing? What are we doing for the cause of Christ? You know, we heard it saying tonight, talked about how good he is to us. I know we are nothing in the flesh. I completely understand that. But how good are we back to him? How good are we back to him? If, if you was to, uh, if you was, if, I was trying to think of what I want to say. If Miss Crystal treated you the way you treat Christ, would you stay married? Now, I don't want to be, I, mean, I hate to pick on you, Brother Donald, because you're just sitting right there. Don't sit up front. Y'all move back someplace else. But think about that. If you're married, if you treated your spouse the way you treat Jesus, would they stay with you? How good, how, how good are we to him? What do we do for him? Do, would, would our, if we never told our spouse, if I never told Miss Tina that I loved her, how long do you think she'd hang around? If I never did anything for her, and I know we're not going to give Jesus something for his body, okay, just, just use your imagination here a little bit with me. If I never got her anything for our birthday, never got her anything for anniversary, never made sure the girls got her anything for Mother's Day, never did anything for her, think she'd hang around? 
you kick Peter to the curb, wouldn't you, Don? He don't do any of that anyway, right? No, really. But how often do you think they'd hang around? What about our friends? Just in our friendships. If you had a friend that just constantly, constantly mooched off of you, all they ever wanted was money. All they ever wanted was time. All they ever wanted was this. They always had problems. You would eventually try to work your way away from them, right? Probably. I've had. Do we treat Jesus the same way? Boy, we'll come to him with our wish list. We'll come to him when we need things. But very rarely do we ever just lay down on the altar and tell him how much we love him. Very rarely do we just go out and just say, Jesus, what is it you want me to do? I, I'll stuff bags. I'll clean the bathrooms. I'll, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, I'll help Brother Rod open the doors. Whatever you need me to do, Lord, I'll just do it because I can give back to you. He's too, way too big to stay steady. He was too big in this man's life. He just could not stay setting. He wanted to go with Jesus. When Jesus told him what to do, he immediately ran and do it. He immediately ran and did it. Do it. Boy, that was great English there, wasn't it? Let me say this lastly. Verse number 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by the ship under the other side, much people gathered unto him. He was nigh under the sea. So we see in verse number 20 this man that had been possessed goes out and begins to publish and then when jesus passed over says pass over again so that tells me he's coming back many people gathered unto him and he was nigh unto the sea can i say that this man possessed with the devil when we see back again in verse number uh, uh verse number two when he was come out of the ship immediately there met him that out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit and verse number six talk about how when he saw jesus afar off he ran and worshiped him why he ran to seek him he's way too big for us not to seek him somebody had told this man or he had heard stories or somewhere along the line something about jesus he then goes out and tells everybody in verse number 20 in verse number 21 when jesus comes back again much people gathered unto him and he was nigh unto the sea they went to seek and see what was going on how often do we seek jesus how often do we seek him not only how much do we do for him, how often do we seek him? Do we strictly seek him when we need help? We took those prayer requests tonight. Is that the only time we go to the Lord is when we need help? When we need that prayer request? When was the last time, as I said just a minute ago, when was the last time you told him you loved him? When was the last time you just thanked him for everything he's blessed you with? When was the last time you just thanked him for everything he's done for your life? He is too big for us not to seek him. You know, I, I, this is just strictly uh, my uh, opinion and my little uh, dabbling tonight, maybe so to speak, in politics. You cannot go out into this world without dealing with just a whole lot of nonsense. It is ridiculous, the, some of the stuff that goes on into this world. It would do us a lot of good the first thing we did in the morning when we got out of bed is to seek Jesus. Lord, I'm going to need your help today. I'm going to come across somebody today that's going to talk nonsense. I'm going to come across somebody today that is absolutely going to get under my skin and make me furious and make me mad about politics, about religion, about whatever it may be. Lord, I'm going to need your help not to do something foolish today. Lord, I'm going to need your help just to let your light shine in my life. How often do we seek him? These people had came back on the other side and they come to seek Jesus how often do we seek him how big is he in your life tonight he's too big in this man's life for him not to have done certain things how big is he in our life let's be honest with ourselves tonight how big is I understand I said a minute ago I understand completely we're talking about the Wednesday night crowd I know exactly who's here thank you all for being here but how big is Jesus in your life is he big enough to get you to the altar besides just your prayer, just uh, uh, your request list? Is he big enough for you to want to be able to do anything for him and just give back? Is he big enough in your life to get rid of all the other nonsense that goes on? Is he big enough in your life that when you, you're faced with that decision, that worldly decision, you know, know what, uh, you know, I know the old little saying, so they can sell all their little uh, uh, bracelets or whatever, but how, is he big enough in your life to say, what would Jesus have me to do right here? Lord, what do you want me to do right here? Lord, what, what, is, what do you suggest my next step be in whatever it is that you're facing? How big is Jesus in your life? Sometimes I'm afraid he's just big enough to get us to church on Sunday, just big enough to get us to church on Wednesday, but that's about it. 
He's not big enough for us to truly go out into this world and make a difference. Can I say this is one man that was possessed with a, a, a multitude of unclean spirits that it says right here. And this one man all of a sudden brought a whole group of people. He sent a whole group of people out to say once. He brought two groups. If you remember, uh, God just gave me this. So I'm going to open my Bible back up and we'll just we'll keep right on going. We look at him in Mark chapter number 5. Well, I guess I must have moved that uh, bookmark right there. We seen, what did it say there in Mark chapter number 5, where he was reading from? He said in the first group, uh, after he's had the unclean spirits come out, and in verse number, um, where was that? In verse number 14, And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what, was, see what it was that was done. So you got a whole group that come in there, and then we know we just talked about in verse number 21, we have the whole group that came back the second time after he himself went out and told it. How, much, how big is he in our life? How much does he show out to the world? Can I say that we are without excuse in as such a dark time in our world not to allow Jesus' light to shine. For uh, the world around us not to see something different in us. That they most definitely should always be able to look at our life and it's like, you're just different. You're different than everybody else. You just have a different attitude 99.9% .9 of the time. How big is he in our life? Ask Brother Clint to come get a song, a verse of invitation. We'll invite you to come tonight. Uh, maybe just want to come and thank him for how big he is in your life. Maybe you've reached that spot in your life, and hopefully that's a spot that we are, that when we're faced with those uncertain times, when we're faced with those uncertain decisions, we just know Jesus is going to take care of it because he's just that big in our life. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day. Lord, we're thankful for how big you are, Lord. Lord, just not only how big you are in this man's life, but Lord, how big you can be in each and every one of our lives, Lord, at the same time. Lord, we're just thankful for uh, everything you've done for us. Lord, we just ask you to speak to hearts during this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.